By working together, we make elections possible. An entire community of your friends and neighbors are working to ensure a secure, transparent, and accurate election in Maricopa County. Discover what it takes by visiting BeBallotReady.vote to learn about the August primary election and how to get involved. That's BeBallotReady.vote. Al trabajar juntos, hacemos posible las elecciones. Toda una comunidad de sus amigos y vecinos está trabajando para asegurar una elección segura, transparente y precisa en el Condado Maricopa. Descubra lo que se necesita visitando tengaboletalista.voto para aprender más sobre la elección primaria de agosto y cómo involucrarse. Visite tengaboletalista.voto. Well, hello and welcome. We hope you liked our new TV commercial, which is part of our 2022 media campaign message to be ballot ready. I'm Betty Galanter, the voter outreach manager for the Maricopa County Elections Department. And thank you so much for joining us today. The Maricopa County Elections Department is pleased to provide information to you, our Maricopa County voters, on what to expect for the upcoming August primary election and the options to participate. But first, let me share our agenda with you. We're going to begin by me sharing some key primary election information. Then we're gonna have a panel discussion with our election experts who will provide information on early voting, in-person voting, voter registration, and how to get involved in elections, followed by a short Q&A. Then we're gonna talk about election security with another Q&A session, and then I'll wrap things up by providing more information on how you can find election education information and resources. But a couple of things to remember. Um, you can enter your questions via chat anytime. Simply select the chat feature, type your question, and click Submit. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the time that we have together. This and all of our virtual presentations are recorded, so they will be uploaded to YouTube later for future viewing. And to enhance our time together, please keep your cameras off and keep your mics on mute. So with that, let's get started. Let's take a look at some key election dates. So June 18th has come and gone, but we've mailed out our early ballots to our overseas and military voters. And then what's coming up next week, really soon, is our voter registration deadline. That's July 5th, a key date to keep in mind. July 6th is when we are going to begin mailing out our early ballots for the August primary election to voters on the active early voting list, better known as ABLE, and to the voters who have made that one-time request to be on that early um, ballot. So remember though, if you are an independent voter or a voter registered without a party preference, even if you're on the ABLE list, you must actively request a ballot of your choice. So that would be Republican or Democrat or nonpartisan, ballot available for the city or town in which you live. July 6th is also the date when the voting locations and ballot drop boxes are open. July 22nd, that is also a key date because it's the last day to request an early ballot by mail. And we do suggest and we recommend that you mail back your early ballots to us by July 26th so that we can receive it on time. And finally, key date. August section, election day, all ballots must be received by the elections department no later than 7 p.m. sharp on election day. And remember, those postmarks do not count. So ballots received after election day, even if they are postmarked, as mailed on election day, they're not going to be valid by law, so therefore they will not be counted. Okay, so let's look at voting options. Um, we in the Maricopa County Elections Department want to make sure that you are aware of all of your voting options for the upcoming primary election. Now, that's whether you decide to vote in person or vote online. Our goal is to provide safe, secure, reliable, and accessible choices. So a couple of fun factoids. Did you know that there are nearly 2.6 million registered active voters in Maricopa County? of which 77%, that's right, 77% are on that active early voting list. We are also the second largest voting jurisdiction in the United States. 
So in order to serve the millions of voters over a very large geographic footprint, the county offers four separate voting models for you. You can vote by mail as an early voter. You can drop off your signed and sealed affidavit envelope at any of the secure ballot drop boxes or uh, drop box only sites. Or you can vote in person early at one of our vote centers, or you can vote on election day in person. And we're gonna have over 200 vote site centers by election day in what we call a vote anywhere vote center model. Now this allows a Maricopa County registered voter to be able to vote at any one of those vote centers on um, election day or earlier. And so what this means is this model will allow you, as example, if you are working, um, to be able to vote in a vote center near your workplace. You do not have to rush home to find a vote center near your home. Um, we think that this is going to be great um, options and we will begin opening them, as I mentioned, on July 6th, all the way up through election day. And then as we get closer to election day, we will provide by that time over 210 vote centers. And on average, these vote centers are about two miles apart from each other. They are near bus lines and light rail line, bus routes and light rail lines. So they're very convenient. They're located throughout Maricopa County. That includes in serving our rural communities, our Native American tribes, and of course, our densely populated areas within Maricopa County. So this ensures that all voters in Maricopa County will have offered an in-person voting experience or option if they so choose. So let's take a look at locations. Where do we place these vote centers, right? Or how do you find one? Well, what we do is we basically have vote centers based on data. We are data driven. So we ensure that we can have adequate coverage of voting locations throughout Maricopa County. We use the data like this. This is an example of a heat map that uses the 2020 in-person voting election data. This map provides great insights to us on where in-person voting may happen during the 2022 um, elections, where they are most likely to vote. And we are going to be able to um, have you find the vote center location near you by simply going to locations.maricopa.vote. Now this website has a searchable tool for voters to find your vote center location the hours, the wait times, and much more. Simply type in your address, and then you can choose where and when it's convenient for you to vote in person or to drop off an early ballot. And remember that if you're dropping off an early ballot, you do not have to wait in line. You can simply enter the vote center location and then head toward the secure drop box and insert your ballot there. Again, to find a vote center near you, simply go to locations.maricopa.vote. Now we realize that most voters uh, don't really know what it looks like inside of a vote center. And so what can you expect? Well, first of all, the vote center model required new election equipment. And this election equipment includes what you see here on the screen. Starting from the left, the site book, the ballot on demand printers, accessible voting devices, precinct-based tabulators, and of course, that um, envelope drop box. So let's start with the site book. The site book does have award-winning technology and it checks in all the voters. It's what the voter will see when they first walk into the vote center. Um, if you can remember back in 2016, we didn't have this type of technology. So we had paper rosters uh, for check-ins. And that was such a manual process. It was so tedious and it took so much time. It really was not reliable. This site book provides faster check-in speeds because it allows for more than two voters to check in simultaneously at a polling location. And it connects directly with the Maricopa Recorder's voter registration system, which provides a secure, enhanced, and streamlined voter experience. And we do estimate that on average, it's only going to take a voter between four to six minutes uh, to vote in the 2022 August primary ballot using this technology. Essentially, the site book is a check-in terminal. It'll guide the voter through a series of screens and voters will answer questions. 
of their choice in either English or Spanish, and that will help identify their eligibility and ensure that the correct ballot is issued to them. When a barcode scan of an ID, um, with a barcode scan of an ID, like say a driver's license is used or by entering the voter's name, voters can check in and prove their uh, proof of identity to a trained poll worker before that ballot is printed. And what's really cool about this piece of technology is the site book also allows voters to update their address and make name changes in real time during check-in. Um, that eliminates provisional ballots to be issued to that voter for the voters, of course, that change the names or addresses after the voter registration deadline. Next is that ballot uh, on-demand printer. So each ballot has a ballot code and during early voting, that envelope is also printed. And the poll workers are trained to make sure that the voter signs the envelope, it's sealed, before it is entered into the uh, drop box there. We also, in case you didn't know, um, offer, AD, we have ADA requirements in all of our vote centers, and we offer a variety of ways in which voters with disabilities can vote with the accessible voting device that you see here. Those assist folks with um, perhaps vision or hearing or movement disabilities. And we also offer curbside voting to all of the voters that perhaps they don't want to leave their vehicle. And another did you know, I love these facts, eight to 10% of all voters still cast a ballot at the polls on election day. So in every voting location on election day, there is a precinct ballot, a precinct based tabulator. Now these ballots are counted using these machines and then that information is stored on memory cards, which is then securely sent back to the elections department at the close of election night. So now that you know your options to vote and what happens once you vote, where does your ballot go? Well, Viracopa County tracks every ballot. Each voter's affidavit envelope is unique to them, as you can see here in the green envelope with the barcode, and it's also unique to the specific election. So that allows voters to track their ballot every single step of the way by going online to their ballot dashboard at bballotready.vote or by texting JOIN to 628-683. That will allow early voters to be notified when your ballot is processing, when it was mailed out, when we received it back, um, when it was verified, when it was counted. And in-person voters can also get these alerts. We know that this is a great um, opportunity to allow voters to have peace of mind in knowing that their vote was counted. So go to beballotready.vote. Beballotready.vote, it really provides voters with your personalized election information on your own voter dashboard. It really is the easiest way to know your voter registration status, make any kind of update that you need. You can even print your digital voter ID card and there's really just so much more. So it's why we do call it the Maricopa County Voters Way as a one-stop shop to find all of the important election information that is needed. So now, Let's take a look at this. Well, I hope that you found the video enjoying and also that the top line primary election information was helpful to you. And now it's going to be time for our 
panel with our moderator, Fields Mosley, our communications director for Maricopa County. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fields Mosley. I'm the communications director here in Maricopa County, and I'm very fortunate to be uh, with three of the top election officials in the country uh, here with us today. And they all work right here in Maricopa County to make sure our elections go off smoothly uh, here in 2022. So we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes or so talking about a number of aspects of elections and how it affects voters like yourselves. So uh, and picking their brains a little bit about what we've seen and, uh, and how things have been going and how they're getting prepared. So with that, a few quick bios. We'll start with Ray Valenzuela down on the end there. He is the co-election director for Maricopa County Elections Department. He's responsible for all the mail-in voting and the election services. Ray joined the department in 1990, making him a 32-year veteran, not 32 years old, a 32-year veteran. A wealth of knowledge here uh, for everyone in the elections department as well as the recorder's office. So he is a certified elections registration administrator and Arizona elections official, a graduate of the Maricopa County Management Institute, and previously served as both chair and vice chair on the U.S. Election Assistance Commission Standards Board. Next, we have Janine Petty, who's with us today, and she is the senior director of voter registration for Maricopa County. Uh, she was formerly the deputy state elections director for Arizona, and prior to that served as a local elections official in Yavapai County for a number of years. She's a member of the National Association of Election Officials and maintains her certification as an election registration administrator and Arizona elections official. She currently serves on the executive board of the U.S. Elections Assistance Commission Standards Board. Distinguished uh, co-elections director for Maricopa County Elections Department. He is responsible for all in-person voting and tabulation operations uh, with a strong background in auditing that's how I first met Scott. Uh, Scott has served with the county for more than 20 years now. He is a veteran of the United States Coast Guard. Scott is a certified Arizona elections official and elections task force member of the Bipartisan Policy Center and serves as the vice president of the election officials of Arizona. So welcome to you all. Thanks for being a part of this webinar today and taking some time out of your schedule. So let's uh, let's just say what we all know is reality. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, local news coverage as well as national news coverage of elections here in Maricopa County since the 2020 election. Of course, many more stories uh, generated on social media. Some of you might have seen some of those out there. Some true, not some not so true. So we have a lot to talk about whenever it comes to elections and, and what is the reality of elections. So why are elections so important right now in your opinion? And uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges facing elections in Maricopa? Thank you, happy to be here. And I think that all three of us would agree that all elections are important. Um, this one is no different. I think one of the challenges that we're facing right now is a lot of misinformation and disinformation that's being circulated. Um, one of the things that we strive to do is events like this, where we're making ourselves available to the public. We're trying to get the, the information from trusted resources like our Yavapai, or, I'm sorry, Maricopa County Voter Registration and uh, Elections Division websites, the Secretary of State's office. Um, they also have the election site there, a lot of information about how and why we do what we do. And those are the places that we want people to go to get that trusted information so we can start building that trust and um, integrity in what we're doing and make sure people understand the process. And they can go to Yavapai County for trust. If you live in Yavapai County. Yes. <laughs> and they probably have reliable information as well. <laughs> Scott, well, the same question to you. you know, what, what do you think is important right now? And what are the challenges you feel like elections are facing in America? Well, First, thanks, I'm glad to be here. And I have to agree with Janine that um, dealing with this mal disinformation is a challenge for all election administrators nationally, as well as Maricopa County. We've been the epicenter of a lot of inaccurate information and that has created challenges for us, especially from a recruiting standpoint and voter trust. But that's not the only thing that we're facing. We face supply chain issues. And uh, if, if something that everyone is experiencing is inflationary pressures. So something that's no different is we have to recruit over 3,300 temporary poll workers to support this upcoming August primary. But typically, a lot of people think that our poll workers and our temporary workers are volunteers, but they're not. We pay them, and usually they make right around minimum wage. Uh, but with the challenges of they would all have to commute long distances, especially come support us here at the Maricopa Tabulation Center. A lot of our folks live on the outlying areas of town, so the long distances of commutes, then they would encounter um, higher gas prices for them to be able to support that commute. Um, and so it's just created a lot of challenges for us to be able to recruit those temporary workers, those members of the community. 
I was just looking at the slide deck. Um, a lot of the faces are the poll workers that will be working out at the community and being able to ensure that we have enough temporary workers. And I'd say the biggest challenge right now is hiring our warehouse workers and our drivers. Uh, we have a great partnership with the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. We've actually been able to increase some of our salaries up from what was 15 up to $19 for our truck drivers, um, but it's still not yielding um, the necessary truck drivers that we, we will need to support this election. And I will say that we're just went to the Board of Supervisors um, one last time, and they've approved a bonus. Um, so if we're going to have uh, some of our temporary workers that are working here out of the McTech Tabulation Center um, for over four weeks or up to 400 hours or over eight weeks up to 750 hours, that they will be eligible for an additional bonus on top of their salary of $1,000. So there's some ways that we're working to overcome those challenges. Try to attract people so now you can, you can get the word out, right? That's right. Okay, that's what this is. Part of, part of this is about. So uh, let's go now to Ray Valenzuela. And Ray, same question to you. You know, why do you feel like elections, obviously elections have been very important in your career, your entire career here in Maricopa County. And uh, and what do you think, um, uh, what do you think some of these challenges are in, if you're laying here at the elections? I think my co-presenters have obviously presented the misinformation challenge of trying to, you know, get that truth out there, the supply chain, as far as staffing. And I think, uh, we have a lot of things, but one of the ones that probably is in a challenge realm is, and it's on a national level, is uh, really dealing with paper supply. So we have had, and nationally, there are jurisdictions that are having that issue. And we just want to put out there that we are fortunate enough to have been partnered with a vendor that we knew this was coming two plus years ago. So we are in a good position. We've ordered over 4 million ballots, and that's to accommodate for a primary and a general. So it's a big task to get this done. 4 million ballots for early balloting, 4 million envelopes, 4 million affidavits. So just to give people that knowledge and, and know, because again, it is in the national media, the challenge for supply chain and paper that we have overcome that. So at least rest assured that your early ballots and your ballots at your polling places will be available and we're on top of that. All right, very good. Uh, so I wanna go back to Scott now. If there's one thing that voters need to know to get ready for the August primary, in your mind, what is that? You're only going to give me one thing. <laughs> well, we got three people, so I think you guys all have something to say. Well, I think I have the one thing, but uh, I do want to say one thing that voters should know is um, that 2022 is going to be very similar to 2020, and it's going to be very similar to elections that we administered before that. So we follow state statute and how we design our election plans. And so that will include that voters can choose how they want to participate in the upcoming or they want to participate through their early ballot that we'll mail to them if they're on the active early voting list, or they want to take that early ballot and drop it off at one of our voting locations, or they want to uh, vote in person, whether that's early during emergency voting or voting at, on election day at our polls. But for those in-person voters, and since I in see and oversee in-person voting, I just want to make sure that they're aware that we do have ID requirements if they're going to turn up to vote in person. And not all states do. So Maricopa County has been the fastest growing county uh, in, the, in the nation for the last 10 years. So we will have a lot of new voters that are moving into Maricopa County, and they may not have had that same type of ID requirement. And we've also then, post-2020, now we've moved to an ID requirement for our early voters as well, if they're voting in person. They will be putting that ballot in an affidavit envelope and signing, but in order to get that, they will need to provide ID. For the vast majority of people, that's just their driver's license, right? As long as that driver's license matches um, the address that's on our rosters, our voter registration system. But if they don't have a driver's license or they don't have a driver's license that matches their address, there's other avenues as well. I encourage them to go to our website. We have a brand new website. And under the voting tab, you can look and there's a section for ID at the polls and that gives them all the different options that they would need to vote in person. All right, there was more than one. Yes. <laughs> Janine, uh, same question to you. I mean, what do you, what do you, what is one, maybe two things that voters need to know in your mind? 
Well, coming from a voter registration perspective, um, I always say that the voter registration database is the foundation of a successful election. You need voters to have an election. So first and foremost, if you're not registered, get registered. The deadline is July 5th. Make sure you submit your registration form. For those that are currently registered, let's make sure that you are checking your registration status. Um, have you moved? Have you not informed us of a move? Do you want to change your party? Um, looking those things up and being fully prepared and ready we um, have, as Scott mentioned, a great updated website. Um, there's a voter dashboard, so you can get on there, you can check your status and make sure that you are ready to, to vote. That's be ballot ready, correct? Be ballot ready, exactly. <laughs> so not too hard to find, and it is very easy to use. I can attest to that. I've tried it several times. Uh, Ray, in your mind, what, what are a couple of things that voters really need to know? And, mm -hmm. and maybe from early voting perspective. From an early voting perspective, obviously, the, we, the one key thing, because August primary, on top of ID and this and that, we have 2.1 million voters on our ABLE, or active early voting list. For those of you that are on that, you'll automatically be getting a ballot. However, the one key thing for the state of Arizona is the open primary, which means independents can't participate. We want to drive this home because they are the largest group of demographic voters within at least Maricopa County and probably the state. So as an independent voter, especially if you're on ABLE, active early voting list, we can't automatically send you that ballot because we don't know which one to send you. The primary is a nominating election, so you must, to participate, you select, tell us, do I want a Republican? Do I want a Democrat? Or there isn't 23 of our 25 cities and towns are on this August primary, so we do have a city town only version if you really say, I just want to vote on the local. But again, that's one of the key things that I think we want people to take away today to what, if you haven't, if, if you do have an, or are an independent, to make sure you let us know what it is. And I'm going to give one more plug, which I know that the slide did, but beballotready.vote is the actual, if you type that in there, you can check that personal dashboard and check your party affiliation. You may think you're one or the other. Go there and see, and you can write that in there and make that request. And it also tells you which elections you voted in in the past, correct? Yes, actually, it's a really nice feature. It gives you uh, right up front at least 10 years worth of voting history. How you voted, did you vote early? in person so it's a lot of personal voter information that's why it's a personalized election dashboard that'll give you your party your mailing address your resident address some people that's another thing for mail voting sorry that's the second point then <laughs> but a lot of people don't realize they have a mailing address or they think they do so that's another thing to look at on that be ballot ready .vote. yeah i was surprised and and because uh, the primary is different than the general. It's always a good point. And I know you guys have been out there talking about this a lot. It's a good point to drive home because, you know, I went down there not too long ago and I saw, wow, I've never voted in a primary. And, uh, you know, and I just, I hadn't even thought about that. I thought I had. So I know our memories all get a little bit fuzzy because it only comes up every couple of years. But uh, yes, that's a, and that's a big deal. And so making a point of voting in the primary. Can I just add one thing to pick it up? Of course you so, can, Scott. <laughs> so you're, my, you're a third point. Third point. Come on. <laughs> so before those independent voters, they can make their, that ballot request all the way even up to election day if it's in person at one of our voting locations as well. Very good. All right, next question. Let's talk about continuous improvement. That is part of the elections department mission. And I know you guys are always looking at how, how we can be better because this is a, you know, we have a lot of voters here in Maricopa County. It's a huge voting district, right? So Scott, let's talk, talk, that, talk about continuous improvement. What do you, what do you see? Uh, what have you guys improved? What are you working toward? So I'll again, focus on some in-person improvements. So first we are expanding the number of voting locations up from where we were in the August August election two years ago. We we're expanding from 99 to up to over 200. And I saw that Betty had that on her slide early in the presentation. But to make sure that those voting locations run very smoothly, we introduced a brand new premium poll worker training course. It's a two day course, uh, 16 hours of training. We're requiring, we have one premium poll worker trained. Usually it's our inspector, the supervisor of the location at every one of those locations. They're trained on everything from how to use the equipment, how to tr troubleshoot the equipment, right? how to change toner if our, our printer runs out of toner, all of those types of things. But we go through a lot of scenarios based off prior elections, challenges that voters would have had. And this really allows us to provide the optimal customer service. So we can have our poll workers work through solu solutions and identify, okay, this is a challenge that a voters had, how can we best serve that voter so they can have a positive in-person voting experience. All right. Janine, what about in voter registration? Well, we have been moving and shaking in voter registration. 
Um, I think that everybody that was an existing registered voter was um, should have received a brand new voter ID card as part of the Independent Redistricting Commission um, changes to boundary lines. So we were required to send out brand new voter ID cards. And as part of that, we gave our voter ID cards a facelift. Um, voters can get all of the information that they need to about the status, um, making sure that everything on that voter ID card is current and correct. In addition to that, we again touting the website, that voter dashboard, you can go on there and you can also print off a digital voter ID card if you want to have it um, fresh and handy there. Um, in addition to that, on our, our new voter ID cards, there's also tons of links and information about how you can get involved in the process as well. And, uh, maybe come and, and work for Scott or Ray doing some election work on election day. Yeah, we hope so. We hope some people take advantage of that. Uh, and, and Ray, what about you with continuous improvement? Where do you, where do you see things going? Obviously, it's not just a mission. It is a, a requirement for us to continue to improve and better. And kind of segueing off what both of uh, my co-presenters are saying, for early voting, sticking to divisional presentation, I think we do a great job of early voting. It's making that information and presenting it to the voters, how much checks and balances are in this process. But on continued improvement, specifically what we listened, one of the things is signature verification. We obviously do signature verification 100% on all early ballots that come back are signature verified. One of those things, though, there is, and one of the, maybe it's not misinformation or disinformation, is how do we go about curing those if something doesn't match? Somebody, we get that, so my, I, my signature's changed. Well, the fact of the matter is, is continued improvement is we have a process built into where we're notifying voters have been and doing early voting for 30 years in Arizona. Uh, we notify them by email, by letter, if we have a question on their signature. And one of the key things is by text. I, and again, I don't like to promote a certain company, but we are the Amazon of election. People love to track their, their packets. You can track your ballot. You can do that through texting the word join to 628-683. Sign up to get those tracking messages. And that will tell you when we're sending your ballot. That will tell you when we got it back, that it's under signature verification and to that point of continued improvement. If we have a question on the signature, it will tell you, call us. But one of the features that we've added on top of text, on top of email, on top of a letter is we have a process or an application that's built out that's called Text to Cure. It's one more feature that hopefully you don't have to use that you're not one of the folks. And we did a really good job. Uh, in 2020, we were only at 507 signet voters that actually we could not get a hold of out of the 20,000 and the 1.9 million. But again, just look for that if you, if, and know that we are continuing to strive to make the process more efficient, more safe, more secure, and transparent. Well, I think you guys all covered this here. You know, it's, it, I've heard it said many times, allowing voters to vote the way they want to vote. And that's a part of this too, uh, when you have so many options. So you've all mentioned uh, misinformation or disinformation or malinformation that's out there. Uh, that leads to a lot of questions. So I'm gonna give you a chance to, Tell us either your favorite question or what you get asked the most and what your response is to that. I'll start with Scott. So I um, think and something that's actually very prevalent in sort of the news, especially on social media today, is um, concern about drop boxes. And questions are, if I drop my early ballot in a drop box, is it uh, secure and is the elections department going to get it? Um, or can I trust and is it, is it a reliable um, drop box for me to be able to use? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So the elections department goes through every effort and we follow uh, all of our legal requirements to ensure that our voting, voting drop boxes are secure. So we will offer drop boxes in every one of our voting locations, so the 200 plus vote centers. We partner with our city and clown clerk's offices. So there will be anywhere from 15 to 10, they transition throughout the cycle that will have a secure drop box in those locations. Then we'll offer two outside drop boxes um, that are securely fastened to, cemented to the ground. They're under video um, security monitoring for those drop boxes. But most importantly, when we're going out to retrieve those early ballots, first off, it's not a loose ballot. It is a ballot that's inside an early affidavit envelope with that intelligent barcode that Ritley was describing, how we can track that right back to the voter. But then we also um, will send out a bipartisan security team. It has to be a Republican and registered Democrat to go out there and retrieve those ballots. We'll transport those in a container. Those containers are fixed with tamper evidence seals. All of that information is logged on chain of custody forms. They come back here. We do audits of all of that information. There's really no opportunity for us to lose any of those ballots. 
as well as no opportunity for ballots to be inserted into that process. So it's a very secure, um, reliable way for voters to be able to return those early ballots back to the elections department. And that's even before it gets to the signature verification part. That's correct. Um, okay, well, Janine, same question. I mean, do you, do you get uh, common questions all the time and how do you respond to those? Um, we do get questions. I think one of the, the ones that we get quite frequently is about cleansing the rolls and list maintenance. And that is something that we take very seriously. Obviously, what we do is governed by not only federal law, but state law. And we do list maintenance and cleansing of the rolls daily. Um, especially though before elections, we are sending out lots of election mail, um, verifying that the mail is getting to the voter. If it doesn't, the United States Postal Service lets us know or the voter Whoever's at that address will let us know this person's not here anymore. So we're continually cleaning the rolls. We also have staff that goes through obituaries daily. Um, we also get our monthly reports from the Arizona Department of Health and Vital Statistics. So we're um, removing those people as well from the rolls. In addition, we do get reports from the courts about uh, people that unfortunately have been committed a felony and need to be removed from the rolls. And we also get information from other states, you know, about people that have now moved into that state and we need to remove them from our roles. So something that we do and we take very seriously and we're in the middle of, of doing that now. So. And I believe you mentioned earlier that voters can also take action if they happen to move to another state. Uh, exactly. They can, they can remove themselves from a role here so it doesn't even have to go. Through Sometimes, you know, voter registration is not the first thing on your mind when you're doing sure. a big move, but it is very important. So please remember. <laughs> All right, Ray, same question. Uh, you know, what, do, what kind of questions do you get the most and how do you respond? And from an early voting perspective, I'd, I'd actually like to segue a little bit because it does tie to the drop box and tie to list maintenance. Mm -hmm. Early balloting is re revolves around voter registration to the extent that we, one of the things I want to point out, if you get an early ballot, there is a point where it's not 100% because people are moving, just as we were talking, probably 10,000 people move. That ballot already is going out there. So I just want to point out that when you get that packet, if your son has moved away, and I'm more pointing towards my son if he's listening someday, <laughs> her, but uh, if he does, then you, you may need, there is a box on that envelope that says, no longer at this address. Check that box to send it to us. So it could be the post office doesn't know, but I just want, that's one of the challenges and one of the things, but also segueing or, off, or playing, echoing off of what Scott said, the drop boxes, and what you said, Fields, is that these are not loose ballots. These are ballots that we, Registered voters were sent. They were validated. There's a unique piece ID on that packet, and that balance dropped in that drop box. It has to be sealed. It has to come back to us, and we signature verify 100%. So, again, I just wanted to give that. And the only other question I have is how do we ensure, and I'll try to keep it brief, but that I issue you one, two, you spill a copy on that. One of the questions is how do I know ballot one is not counted while ballot two, or you have two ballots in the drop box that were sent? The answer is that unique piece ID. When for me to send you a second ballot, uh, we call it the 01. I need to avoid that, kill it off, for lack of a better word, and, and then I can reissue systematically a second. So there is a lot of checks and balances in all of these processes, starting with registration verification, starting and ending with that signature verification and that system of checks and balances that track that ballot and allow us to issue and reissue. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, uh, all of you. But uh, we're going to go to a lightning round here in just a moment. But I want to tell everybody, I know a number of people have put uh, questions into the chat uh, for our panel here today. We're going to try to get to a number of those questions after this lightning round. But if you do have questions for uh, Scott, Janine, and Ray, specifically that uh, that our folks behind the scenes can't answer or you want just to hear their answer, that's fine. Uh, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But Let's go to the lightning round. We may answer your question here this time. So here we go. And I'm going to go as fast as I can, I guess, here. 15 seconds or less. That's what, I'm, that's what I've been told. That's what I'm, the, I'm the not producers sure that we'll be going. successful in responding <laughs> in 15 seconds. But. So, so Janine, when is the voter registration deadline? 11.59 p.m. July 5th. July 5th. July 5th. That's coming up fast. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. That was lightning uh, fast. Yes. Uh, Ray, when do early ballots go out? They actually go out July 6th, which is Wednesday, and it's always 29 days prior to, or to an election, or I'm sorry, 27 days prior to an election. So yeah. July 5th or the August prior. You two are going to have a, you, you guys are uh, going to have a busy week next week. Yes. All right, uh, Scott, how many voting locations uh, will we have during the August primary? You touched on this earlier. So, well, for election day, it will be about 210, could be 211. It always could fluctuate slightly. 
uh, it depends on the phase. So go to locations.maricopa.vote to find uh, locations that open 27 days before the election, which will be, there's 10 of them, and then find hours of operations at that website. Okay. Uh, I think That's we touched on this seconds. too, but I'm gonna hit it again. Janine, what's that checkbox on the outside of the yellow envelope for? It's if you receive that ballot in the mail and the addressee does not live at that residence any longer, check that box and send it back. Very good. Ray, how can voters track their ballot? Texting the word join 628-683 or through beballotready.vote on your personal dashboard. All right. Uh, and Scott, will voters be able to find wait times online if they want to vote in person? Yes, they will at locations.maricopa.vote and it's a sortable dashboard that you can type in your closest location or you can sort by the wait time. We update those every 15 minutes for every one of our locations that's open. All right, say that website one more time, slowly. Locations.maricopa.vote. There you go, write it down. <laughs> All right, that's a pretty easy one. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Janine, can independent voters uh, vote in the primary? I know we talked about this a bit. Absolutely. Um, for those that are on our active early voting list, they do need to let us know what ballots they want. Um, and as uh, Scott mentioned earlier, in person, you can make your request at that point. So. Okay. And Ray, is the tabulation equipment connected to the internet? Answer is no, no, and no. Uh, but I it never mean, has been. It never has been, and it is again. Uh, you can go to beballotready.vote. When I'm, that's a so encompassing. There are actually short videos on that, and at the bottom one of this, are our tabulator secure? Short video. Watch it. It'll show you the everything you need to know. All right. Very good. And Scott, one last question: uh, When can voters expect us to post the results? So our first posting will be 8 p.m. on election night, and that will be all of the early ballots that we've tabulated at that point in time. They can go to results.maricopa.vote, but we will be then posting results throughout the evening on election day as we're bringing back those results. Maricopa County is over 9,600 square miles, larger than seven states, so we could be posting results up until 1 a.m. in the morning on the following election day. And then one thing that people don't know is um, that cure deadline. So voters, if they had a questionable signature or if they showed up and were issued a provisional ballot because they didn't provide sufficient ID, they have until five business days, sorry, five business days after the election. So that will be when we post our final results after that point. That was longer than 15 seconds. <laughs> All right, so our first question comes to us from Dave and precinct-based tabulators is what we're talking about here. Uh, we need to define precinct-based tabulators. Can whenever you go and you vote at the precinct or at the um, uh, the vote center, um, is it counted right there on a tabulator? So, if you are voting on election day, we offer our precinct-based uh, tabulators, and yes, uh, their vote is tabulated right there when they insert their ballot. And it's the voter, not our poll workers. They'll insert their ballot, and they get a little check mark, and they'll show up on the little screen, and it'll it makes a little noise. And that's how the voter knows that that ballot is cast right at that point in time. And all of that's logged on memory cards, um, encrypted memory cards, and then also through a tally report that's on the precinct based tab. If I, if I may add, just because I saw Dave's question and, and he was more, what does precinct based tab mean? And in the past, it's a holdover. When we used to have precinct based, you had to be a, go to an assigned location and that tabular tabulate only that precinct. Just so that you know, it is still a precinct-based tabular. You just have to be programmed to handle all of the thousand precincts in Maricopa County, all of the election day variations of styles, as you call it. So it's still called a precinct-based tabulator because it tabulates, but now tabulates all precincts. Yeah, gotcha. This was part of our upgrade of our equipment, right? So uh, we could we could do this kind of. Thing. That's correct. And and on election day, we have upwards of six thousand different ballot styles just for the election day ballot, and that tabulator can tabulate every single one of those. All right, thank you. Hopefully that answers your question, Dave. Uh, I, I believe it's Janita had another question and it was about training to be a poll worker. And when do these trainings take place or are they all virtual? How, how does this, how does the training happen? I'm not sure. Looking at you. Is that you? <laughs> okay. So, um, so we did offer for the last uh, 18 months, premium based training for all of our inspectors at our voting location. That's two days of training. Um, but if you are assigned for this specific election, 45 days in advance of the election, we start our poll worker training. We actually started that last week. And we offer both computer-based training, so it's a couple hours of training that our poll workers will go and they learn 
just the basics about the upcoming election, some basics about the equipment. But then they were also be offered a in-person training that we're having at remote locations throughout the entire valley. So we're trying to cut down on that commute that our poll workers would have to encounter to even go to their trainings, making it much more accessible for them to attend. Very good. Okay, so I got another question here, and this is from Becca, and this is about the text messaging feature that Ray has mentioned several times. And, and I've used it and it, it, it works, but I mean, I also get five potential spam calls every single day on my county work phone. So, I mean, how does somebody know, even though they opt in, I mean, how do they know it's real whenever the county is, is texting them from this to tell them their ballot is, is in? And that's a valid question. Again, just like the Amazon of elections that we are, we know that people will get and could. Now, ours comes from a specific, a specific number. But on, on top of that, it identifies this is Maricopa County, and it's you'll, if you're used to getting it, you'll see and recognize it from the number that it comes through. But on top of that, it's very short, very eloquent to the point of saying, this is Maricopa County, your ballot is being prepared, and we'll mail on this day. This is Maricopa County, and your ballot has been received and under signature verification. Again, one more time, this is Maricopa County, and your ballot has been signature verified and sent to be counted. So, so it is, again, just recognizing that and we will, if there is for some reason that that's not clear enough, that they can always call 602-506-1511 and validate their status or again, go to beballotready.vote and use that as a one-off status check. That, that's a great reminder that you can go there and you can, and you can, you can check it yourself on the website uh, and, and you know, you log in, you know it's the official website, you have to put in your information to get logged into your personal information file. Status. All right, um, and I believe it was uh, Barbara had our next question. I hope I got the name right. Um, Becca had her last question. Barbara has this question: If if she goes to drop off her mail in ballot at a at a vote center on election day, does she have to show her ID? So no, she does not. So she and the the great thing is she doesn't even have to stand in line. She can skip the line. Go right into our voting location. Our poll workers will welcome her and then show her directly to our secure ballot drop box. Then she'll be able to drop off that early affidavit envelope, ballot still sealed inside into that envelope. And then those ballots in the affidavit envelopes, along with everything that's voted on election day, will be securely transported back to the elections department. And if I can add to that, your sure. proof of ID for an early ballot is your signature. That's why, well, why don't I got to show ID? Because number one has to be sealed in that envelope. It has to be signed, and when we get it, it has to be remain sealed. It has to be the ballot that we issued with that unique ID number, piece ID, and that signature is vetted. So that's why we can't allow them to bypass the line. They're not checking it. And actually, on continued improvement, one of the things that we learned is looking at lines when we had those. We're fortunate that we're doing a better job, but there were people in line on some of the B roll, as it would be called, standing there leaning over with the green affidavit in their hand. We now make a sign that we put out in front of in those lines that says bypass the line with a big picture of your green affidavit. So one of the continued improvements that get those people out of the line, they don't need to be. And I'll actually throw, throw one thing in here as well. Uh, most of our voter registrations come from online from uh, the motor vehicle department. So if you know that your signature from your driver's license is not how you sign now, you might want to update your registration, give us an updated signature so we can avoid problems with signatures not matching or you know changing over time. Um, so good good idea to keep in mind. Okay. Well, I want to trump everybody and add one more. <laughs> no, but I really do because it, it just gets a good banter back and forth because, and what I forgot and failed to mention, if you get your early ballot affidavit, there is a line next to, underneath the signature says, for questions, questionable signature, we ask you to provide a phone number that will not be put on your permanent record. It's only used if it's questionable. So that's how we actually address a lot of them, is that maybe it is an MBD signature that you register when you're 18 and put a heart over your eye, like my <laughs> registration form has. I didn't realize I'd be 32 years in this field. Uh, but then you have changed and matured that signature. So again, use that green affidavit envelope, effectively sign it, give us that number, won't be on your record, and we can call you to verify over the phone What's your mother? Certain questions, PII that we can identify. All right. So uh, we've been talking about the envelopes. Ray's mentioned a number of times that uh, these envelopes are scanned. And so Dave has the question: Well, when are they scanned? Are they scanned by the couriers whenever they go and they grab, get them from the post office, get them from a ballot drop box, wherever they they are? Are they scanned then, or are they scanned by run back later on? 
So the process is, as Scott indicated, we have the bipartisan teams that are picking those up. They stay secure. They're transferred, sealed. They then are taken when we're ready. Then we're, they're taken to our vendor, Brown Beck Electric Services, which their only job is to basically take a digital image of that, secure those live packets sealed in the packet into a vault and send us those images. We use a, that image to review the signature, compare it against a known vetted signature on file for the vote. So it's during that process that we take, we pick up from the post office or pick up from the drop box. We take those directly to this vendor to, through that high speed process, capture these. We could get upwards of 100,000, 200,000 a day. So they're scanning those and instead of, and this is a better, best practice, a continued improvement one more time, where we're not physically handing those live ballots throughout the whole department. We're taking a picture, putting them in a safe, secure vault. We're utilizing that digital image to do that verification. And at that moment is when they're scanned. And then we disposition them internally here. And then we send back those disposition, a little bit more techy than probably they want to know. But then we get those packets back with that good SIG, questionable SIG, whatever it may be. And that's, that's done in the right And that digital image can be compared to any one of 20 reference signatures that we have. Um, their prior early ballot affidavit return when they registered, when they updated their registration. And they can zoom in and magnify on all the different loops of the signature and all the different pieces that we train through forensic affiliated partners, those signature verifiers. So that's just one, again, Ray mentioned continuous improvement. It's very much value added technology by being able to use that digital image to compare it to all those other reference signatures. All right. So, John has a question about, and this is a good question, you know, if he goes to a vote center or a precinct location and he votes, let's say he votes in Scottsdale, how does Tempe, Chandler, Phoenix, everywhere, how, how do all those other vote centers or precincts know that he voted? So we have a secure real-time connection through our site book check-in stations. This is not our precinct-based tabulators. As Ray said, they're not connected to the internet. But we have a real-time secure connection from our check-in station back to the voter registration database. And as soon as they check in, it immediately notifies the voter registration database, this voter's checked in and received a ballot. So it will not allow us to issue them another ballot. Or if they had received an early ballot, and now they've checked in, we'll immediately cancel off that early ballot. So there's absolutely no way for them to check in and receive two ballots. Um, it will force them so they went to Scottsdale, then they decided to drive to Glendale. When they arrive in Glendale, they will be forced to vote a provisional ballot at that point in time. All right. Thank you for that. Diane has our next question, and it might have a similar answer, actually. You know, what happens, what does a poll worker do if somebody shows up, let's say, from Yavapai County or from Yuma County and, uh, and tries to vote in Maricopa County because they want to get that, that vote in? Maybe they're here visiting or something like that. What does a poll worker do? So the poll workers are trained to first try to explain the scenario or situation to that voter. So in Yavapai County, if they do choose to vote here, that ballot will not count because they're not eligible to vote on any of those local contests or, or, or races. Um, so the poll workers walk through and explain that to them. Now, because of the Help America Vote Act, we cannot turn a voter away. So if they are demanding to vote at that point in time, then the voters would offer them a provisional ballot allow that voter to cast that ballot, it would go into a provisional envelope, and then research would be done. Because it is possible that maybe that voter moved, they registered here, and they registered prior to the voter registration deadline, um, and our system wasn't updated because it was through a paper form, right? And our voter registration team still processing those paper forms, Janine, Janine's team, um, and so they need to do that research. So that's a federal uh, protection that's established that we can never turn a voter away but if, it, if they truly do live out of, out of state or out of the county, that ballot will not count. Okay. Uh, I got another question, and we touched on this a bit earlier, about the teams that go and get the ballots, whether it's from the Postal Service, the Dropbox, and the makeup of those teams. Is it a singular person? Is it, a, is it five people, two people? What is it? Uh, it's never one person. It's okay. always teams of two or more. Um, and state statute requires that they have to be bipartisan. And what that means is you have to be a registered Republican and a Democrat anytime we're going out and moving ballots. So that's whether that's our couriers retrieving the early ballot affidavits from those early voting locations, or whether it's the poll workers coming back on election night from the voting locations to our receiving sites, 
Again, they have to be a Republican and a Democrat. And then we'll set up receiving sites throughout the Valley, 15 of those, because we, if you think about it, um, those poll workers started their day on election day, some of them at 5.30 in the morning. They may not be closing up that voting location until after 8 or 8.30. Um, and then they have to drive. And I mentioned Maricopa County is larger than seven states. So we don't want them driving all the way from Wickenburg to downtown Phoenix. So we'll set up a secure re receiving site. They'll be staffed with patrol deputies. Um, and then also then bipartisan teams of county employees, Republican and Democrat, receiving all that equipment, and then also creating another chain of custody document, a checklist, making sure that those poll workers delivered everything that they were supposed to to that receiving site. If I may just sure. add a little bit, because I don't want those folks that are independent, we just talked about how they are yeah. one of the higher demographics. We also have a recognized party, the Libertarian Party. They are participatory in this process as well. There are statutes that drive that the rep and them for certain, example, adjudication board must be of the two major parties. But I want to make sure that for the independents that we do have boards. When we talk about citizen boards, adjudication boards, hand count, audit board, those are all made up of individuals, bipartisan. Some of them, though, will require three. So when it does, we ask for, and it doesn't outline it has to be a dem rep, we'll ask for a dem rep and a libertarian, a dem rep and an independent. So we have that more than bipartisan, tripartisan, if that's a real word. But just so you know that we're not leaving anybody out. We want those, even the minor party like Libertarian and Independence to be participatory, and they can be, and they are in these other boards. All right, thank you guys. Uh, we do have another question, and I'm not sure this really applies to the 2022 election, but we can talk about this. And, and it was because we had this in 2020, where you actually had people could vote, they could come by and they could handle the curbside service, if you will. And so the question is, uh, if they were participating in curbside service, is there a bipartisan, bipartisan team there for that curbside service that guarantees that vote is counted. So we will be offering, so any one of our voting location does provide that as a service to the voter. All they have to do is drive up. We have a sign outside the voting location. They can call a phone number and then that comes in and rings back to the elections department. And then we notify that voting location that there is a person that needs, uh, if they maybe have a disability and they can't get out of that vehicle, they need assistance. So then we'll send out that bipartisan team out to the to the curbside to give that voter their ballot so then they can vote it and then bring it back in again a bipartisan team bringing it back into the voting location to then insert it into that category again i just don't want to be overridden by scott so <laughs> right, you want to add that there is the curbside he always gets the last word That's <laughs> but the curbside voting is an election day i just want to because from an early voting perspective we have the same offering but it's called special election board it's bipartisan boards that'll go out to the nursing homes, veteran homes, people that need assistance that maybe physically aren't able to get out of that location to go vote. So it's almost like curbside, it's that we come to you. So I wanna know the folks that right now we're offering that, we have upwards of 400 braille ballots or large print ballots and all these different offerings of alternative format and other options such as special election boards that will come to you if you contact us, 602-506-1511. You contact us we'll actually be able to facilitate and we've been very proactive continuing improvement i think we have over 2,000 facilities that we have proactively visited to say we oh, do you have residents that want a mail ballot don't need assistance or residents that do need physical assistance with by that bar party symbol and you can also drop off your voter registration form in a drop box as well so i can get my <laughs> <laughs> all right so we have one we have time for one more question and and becca asked uh, if you if you come to a vote center and you need some sort of assistance, uh, whether you're you know you have some sort of disability that you need some sort of assistance, blind or deaf, or, um, is there somebody there to help them, or should they bring some them somebody with them, and are they allowed to bring somebody with them to help them vote? That is the voter's choice. So they are allowed to bring in an assistant with them, and that assistant can accompany them in even the voting booth. Um, we also offer an accessible voting device so that um, serves voters with um, vision impair impairments, hearing impairments, or mobility uh, impairments as well. Um, but if they do um, arrive at a voting location and they need assistance, our poll workers then can provide that assistance. Now, again, it has to be a bipartisan team that then goes into the voting booth. Now, the poll workers are trained. They can't tell the voter how to vote. They can just assist them with the voting process and reading the ballot to them. They can't, and that's very important, they can't tell or try to persuade the voter to vote in a particular way. 
and there is. Uh, one more the, time, right? One more time. <laughs> but there is because yeah, a lot I did of say this is the last question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did say the questions about the accessible sure. voting device. So not only do, can you, but the whole idea of HAVA is to have that independent, independent voting experience. So there is in every polling place a, a vote assistant device, a ballot marking device where you can use zip up. You can enlarge the ballot and it actually will print you a physical ballot that you will cap. I just want to make sure that it, you can have somebody help you, but the whole idea is there is assistive devices at each location. Right. Well, thank you all so much for your time today, Scott, Janine, and Ray, our election officials, some of our election officials here at Maricopa County, and certainly experts in this field. I want to thank you guys for your great questions today as well. But there's more to come here on the webinar. We're going to go to a short video about poll workers, then it's all about information security. So thanks again for being with us. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Michael Moore. I'm the Information Security Officer for the Maricopa County Recorder's Office and Election Department. Why are we here talking about election security? MDM, or misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, is being used to attack elections. Elections are the lifeblood of democracy. Uh, voter confidence is paramount. If people don't believe the system, if they don't trust the system, they won't participate in it. And you can't have a democracy if you don't have elections. We're fighting MDM with the truth. And that's a big part of why we're here today. And I, I truly appreciate you being here. In this presentation, I'm going to cover what the situation is, what our defenses are, and how you can help. We're going to talk about our election systems. You'll note, uh, especially from the previous panel, the majority of election security is not cybersecurity. We're going to talk about what is an air gap network. And why is it so important to counting the votes? Uh, we're going to talk about how in our organization, we're increasing security with things like port blockers, security enclosures, and uh, implementing a two-person system. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about uh, how we do security assessments and vulnerability scans, how we work with law enforcement, both local and federal, uh, including the ACTIC, DHS, uh, all the threat intelligence sharing that we do. And we're going to close out with uh, the biggest threats and, and, and really go into MDM and how we're combating it. So first, uh, this is a, a high level logical diagram of the election systems that support elections. In the top left, you can see that we've got our uh, elections website that includes both recorder.maricopa.gov, as well as our new website, elections.maricopa.gov, that's connected via our county network to the voter registration system, which you know, obviously these things need to be connected to the internet because, you know, it's, it's a website. If it wasn't connected to the internet, you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, as mentioned in the panel, uh, we also have our site books and our next slide is going to uh, go into just a little bit of detail about the site books. But uh, last but not least, certainly not least, is the election management system. And this is the closed air gap network. It is not connected to the, the county network. It is not connected to the internet. So a majority of our voters actually participate uh, with early voting and, and by mail. So many of you may have not seen our site books. These are uh, custom in-house developed check-in machines that connect to the voter registration database and facilitate voting in person. Uh, the bottom picture here is the ballot on demand, demand printer setup. We have over 10,000 ballot styles. It's closer to 19,000 ballot styles. Uh, you can imagine, depending on where you live, and Maricopa County is very, very large with the second largest voting district uh, that completely detects it, dictates what's going to be on your ballot. Drilling into the uh, election management system, 
let's take a look. So on the, in the top left, uh, here's our logical diagram of it. There's a lot of detail here, but really the most important thing is this is a standalone air-gapped network. There's no connection to the internet. There's no connection to the Maricopa County network. So the question is, what is an air-gapped network? It's a network of computers that they can talk to each other, but they can't talk to other networks, including the, the internet. Why do we have an air-gap network? First and foremost, it's the law. The Arizona Revised Statutes, along with the Election Procedures Manual, uh, which is developed by the Secretary of State, and it carries the weight of law, these documents describe the requirements uh, that dictate a air-gap network. And you can see for yourself, uh, you can look up the Arizona Revised Statutes, you can look up the Election Procedures Manual. Uh, the, the last one is on the uh, Secretary of State's website. So it's the law, but also it's a great idea. The best way to defend a critical resource is to never connect it to the internet. If you think about it, you have to go to these computers in person to even have a chance to mess with them. You can't be sitting in a basement in Russia and attack it remotely. You have to come to the facility to even be able to try to tamper with the system. Here's a short video on how secure are our tabulators. Hey everyone, fill the ballot here. In Arizona, voters use paper ballots to cast their votes. The tabulators are the machines that the Maricopa County Elections Department uses to count those ballots. Before and after every election, our tabulation equipment is tested to make sure your vote is accurately counted. After the election, political parties also do a hand count audit of the results. These are the machines that count early and vetted provisional ballots. And these are the machines you see at the voting locations that count election day ballots. None of the tabulation equipment is connected to the internet. You can see the visible wires here that show the tabulation equipment at our headquarters is routed directly to a secure server, not the internet. This secure server is where results are stored. It's behind glass and on display for the public to view. Anyone can log on to maricopa.vote to watch as our team counts ballots. The cameras stream live 24 seven. Access to this room is restricted and only those with a direct job or oversight of tabulation can access the room. While ballots are being counted, political party representatives and observers are watching. If you're voting in person on election day, you'll see when your ballot is counted. These machines only accept election day ballots and cannot read early ballots or provisional ballots. There are security measures in place, including tamper-proof seals, encrypted memory cards, and locks that keep your vote safe and secure. Learn more at BeBalletReady.Vote. See you there. So we actually have this video and many more like it on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash C as in Charlie slash Maricopa Vote, or just go to YouTube and search for Maricopa Vote. So let's recap what was in the video. Uh, we have a hardwired, isolated air gap network. And you can see in the picture here, uh, that's the railing for all of the uh, network cables that go from the tabulators and the computers that power them to the glass server room, which is down the end of that line. Nothing's ever plugged into the wall other than power cables. Uh, so there's no mystery as to how things are being routed. Uh, you can trace from point A to point B via the, the railing, these cables. Uh, it's on a 24 seven camera feed. You can go to our website. Uh, the uh, exact link is recorder.maricopa.gov slash elections slash election live video. But if you just go to our, our website, you'll be able to find it pretty quickly. The facility has restricted access. It's behind a gate multiple uh, secure doors that are badged, limited access to only the personnel that need access. We've got the encrypted data and memory cards for the precinct tabulators. And uh, the, um, the thing that I'm really excited about, we're gonna show in the next slide is a new thing that we've implemented uh, because like uh, Scott and Ray and Janine mentioned, security is a process. We're not just resting uh, and saying that, that the elections are perfect, we want to make continuous improvement. So one of the things that we've implemented are port blockers 
and an, an external uh, cage for all the PCs. So no one can touch or plug anything into these devices. <clears throat> uh, one of the best defenses is the original hard copy ballots are stored under camera in our vault, which has restricted access. Uh, basically, only the election directors have access to even get into that space. And that's, again, on 24-7 camera. Security is about prevention, but it's also about detection and um, being able to restore or recover. The, the integrity uh, tab here is uh, we talk about the logic and accuracy tests that are performed before and after every single election. So the fact that we don't just trust the uh, the scans of, of ballots, we test the system with known quantities to make sure that it is tabulating correctly, that we're coming up with the, the results that we expect. Uh, we also do the independent hand count, which is performed by the political parties uh, of a statistically uh, significant uh, percentage of the ballots and confirm that they were tabulated correctly and that they match the hand count. And political party observers are present throughout the entire process. So th this is the part that I find really exciting. In inside this box here, you can see uh, that's one of the PCs that powers the tabulators. The orange parts on the back of the computer there, those are port blockers. Uh, I wanted to just basically uh, put hot glue in there, but I was told by the election directors, we can't uh, do something that's irreversible. So instead we've got uh, nice quality port blockers that require a special key to be able to, to remove them. So people couldn't casually plug something in. Uh, but again, this is in a restricted area with very limited access. But the idea is we want to keep ramping up security. We're going to combat uh, the, the possibility that if someone even got into that space, that they'd be able to plug something in. So every port that we're able to uh, fill up with a port blocker is filled. And then on top of that, the whole thing is enclosed in this outer metal case. Uh, we've got the lid off it so you can see uh, the picture uh, of, of the PC here. But uh, in normal use, it's a locked cage. So someone can't even walk up and touch the PC inside of it. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you can see um, this is a USB wireless adapter. Uh, that's the thing that we're really combating against here, is the idea that someone could come up to a sensitive machine like this and plug like something, something like this in uh, that it might possibly connect to the internet. We want to prevent that from even being remotely possible uh, happening. And then the last thing that we're, we're still investigating are Faraday solutions. So we're looking to wrap uh, these enclosures in Faraday material. So even if there was a supply chain compromise, even if somehow someone had put a wireless component in there, that it would be dampened and blocked by this passive Faraday solution. So we partner with so many uh, law enforcement entities. I can't go into the full details of all of it, but uh, you know, in here you can see the election command center. This is where surrounding election dates, uh, we have this room absolutely filled with people supporting elections and we're connected to the ACTIC, which is the fusion center for Arizona. Uh, it ties together local law enforcement with federal. It's basically a one-stop shop that we can report things to and they get it to the right uh, uh, police entity to, to handle whatever we have reported. We also partner with the Department of Homeland Security and CISA. They've performed physical security assessments of our tabulation facility. They provide us with multiple free cybersecurity products. Uh, for the past two years, they provided us with grants to increase election security, uh, both in excess of $100,000. Uh, the FBI's election task force maintains situational awareness of threats and um, you know, most threats that we report to the ACTIC is gonna be investigated by the FBI. MCSO, the, our uh, county sheriff's office, they do so much. They provide uh, security at polling locations, unmarked vehicles, marked vehicles. They do ballot delivery escorts, uh, and they've actually provided CPR training for over a third of our staff who are now qualified in, in CPR in case that's needed. Um, we also have security services, county security services and judicial court security. They're the first line of defense and maintaining physical security of our county facilities and then other local law enforcement. Um, you know, our poll workers are, are set to call 911 if needed. The National Guard is prepared to support us if needed. And we've recently done a presentation similar to this one with uh, these law enforcement entities to make sure that they're as informed and tied into the process as possible. This is a uh, excellent product that's provided by our county's uh, information security team. 
so around the election periods, they they spin up a um, a war room that uh, monitors social media, security events that affect the county, network health of the county, and they let us know uh, if there's anything critical instantaneously, so we can respond to it immediately, and also provide us with hourly updates. So next, let's get into the threats. So you may have heard the term MDM. Uh, let's define it for you real quick. Misinformation. This is when somebody says something that's wrong, but they're not necessarily intending to mislead you, right? So they're saying something wrong, but it's not necessarily a lie. Disinformation, it's a flat out lie. They know what they're saying is wrong and they're saying it on purpose. Their goal is to trick someone and to manipulate them. And malinformation, it's very similar to disinformation, but it uses the truth, uh, but in a dishonest way. It's like uh, taking an interview of someone, clipping their comments, making it seem like they're saying something they're not. You're probably familiar with people doing techniques like that. And in the upcoming slides, we'll, we'll actually show you some, and, uh, uh, some malinformation that uh, affected us directly, that uh, people took a screenshot of our server room that you can view on our election live video, and they altered the image uh, to have content in, in there that is not real. And I really enjoyed this graphic down here uh, at the bottom. This is acquired from CISA. Uh, it, it shows that this disinformation, it's a personal thing and it's up to all of us to combat it. It stops with you. You have to recognize that it is a risk, that it's a threat. When you see things that are po possibly misinformation, question the source. Who posted this? Why did they post it? Investigate it. Especially think before you link. When you share something on social media, you're giving it the weight of your name. You're saying you're giving it validity. You think that it's true. You're making it seem true to your circle of friends. And then the last thing is talk with your circle. You don't have to solve this thing by yourself. If something seems odd, then talk to your friends, your family, those around you and say like, this seems pretty outrageous. Do you think this is real? Like, can you help me research this? Like I mentioned before, voter confidence, voter confidence is a paramount importance to the election process. If people don't believe in the system, the system doesn't work. Irreparable damage has been done to a significant portion of our voters. By eroding faith in our systems, Democracy is literally under attack. Elections aren't about winners, they're about losers accepting that they had a fair chance and the graceful transfer of power. At this point, our foreign adversaries, they don't need to put in much effort. We're doing this to ourselves. If things ever cool off, it's very easy for a foreign adversary to just in inject fresh MDM and think like, who, who do you think benefits from the polarization that we're experiencing uh, and the division? Uh, it's, it's not us, it's our adversaries. So here's the current MDM threat landscape. It's being distributed by uh, traditional media or things that claim to be traditional media, social media. There are public officials that are spreading it. Our response to this is trying to spread the truth wherever possible. Uh, so our one-stop shop for that is just the facts.vote. CISA also has a rumor control that's related. It's cisa.gov slash rumor control. The barrier is being greatly reduced to create believable looking fake content. The average citizen doesn't want to research every single thing. It's impossible to know what's real and what's not. Uh, credible sources are being attacked for the trustworthiness, like some traditional medias, uh, the government offices, election officials. But other election officials, government offices, media are spreading the MDM. So it's difficult for an individual to know which source to trust. The upcoming threats are uh, what's called synthetic content. You may have heard it referred to as deep fakes or even cheap fakes. Some recent examples of this are uh, the Ukrainian president. There's a, a fake video of directing soldiers to stand down and surrender. Uh, on our next slide, we're going to start to drill into the picture of our server room that has EMS password on a, on a poster on the wall. Uh, there's also a fake moon landing failure Nixon speech that is incredibly believable. I highly recommend that you, you look it up to uh, help be aware of, of the threat. This is something that affected us directly. If Again, if you go to our website uh, on the election live video, this is one of our cameras that we stream 24-7 to the internet. This is our uh, election management system server room. You can see it's behind glass. 
And there's this uh, page up in the top right. Uh, this is a tweet that is still live today. I've edited so as to not give the, the poster uh, more, more credence, more, uh, more views. This kind of thing is easily disproved. We can pull up our cameras and we can see that there's no paper on the wall. We can go to the timestamp and prove on the original stream that there's no paper on the wall. This kind of content is higher quality than needs to be for a simple troll. If we zoom in, and I apologize, it's a little bit garbled, you can see in the top left, that's the Maricopa County uh, logo that they bothered to put on there. Uh, you can just barely read EMS password below there. You can see router password, uh, but the actual passwords in here are too garbled to read. The alignment of this page is really good. It's been edited to be behind the glass. So when we shared this with our information security team, they threw it into a, a photo forensics tool that does error level analysis. It visually demonstrates if there are different compression rates of images occurring. And you can see, well, what, what here seems to be lighting up like Christmas, this area where the page was is completely different. It shows that this image was doctored. So this is it zoomed in a little bit more. You can tell that this is completely different. It doesn't have the same compression errors as, as it, around it. But here's the question. What percentage of people would have believed that, that that image, the original image was real? How many would have tried to confirm whether or not it was? How many people presented even with the above that I showed you wouldn't care and still would think that it's real? So, Here's what it comes down to. Like, how can you help? Um, I really enjoy this quote. If, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. In elections, we want to go far. In democracy, as a nation, we want to go far. We have to go together. How can you help? One, please vote. Please vote informed. Volunteer to be a poll worker. Demand intellectual integrity of yourself. Demand intellectual integrity of others normalize requesting citations think about it you know people that believe in conspiracy theories ones that have been repeatedly debunked that lack evidence that have cost real taxpayer dollars they're contacting their election officials it seems that people that look at the evidence of clean elections that see a lack of of widespread fraud aren't contacting their elected officials so it's this feedback loop of election officials that believe the MDM and then their constituents are calling back to them. Um, people tend to only vocalize when they see something negative. We're also hiring thousands of people to run major elections. Some of those people are going to believe that elections are corrupt and that they're being stolen. When you come at something as thinking that you're writing a wrong done to you, you feel like you're free to do anything. We need people we can count on to not try to throw a wrench in the works and report up the proper chain if they see something that's wrong. Uh, speaking of intellectual integrity of yourself, everyone is susceptible to confirmation bias. We, we believe what we believe, and we tend to cherry pick evidence to back up those beliefs. When you hear something bad about someone that you uh, like, you don't want to believe it. When you hear something good about someone you do like, you do want to believe it. And we have close family, friends, leaders that we trust that share our beliefs. It can be difficult to challenge those that are close to us. But if we don't, that's called groupthink. Uh, when you share a feeling of solidarity and you're highly concerned with maintaining the relationship with the group at all costs, that's what blew up the challenger because people were afraid to speak up. Uh, and the last thing I want to leave you with is a quote from Carl Sagan. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So when you hear extraordinary things, please demand extraordinary evidence. So that was an awful lot of wonderful information. And I thank all of our presenters, our moderator, our panelists, and also you, our, uh, our voters that asked so many great questions. We really appreciate that so much. Um, we are here in the Voter Outreach Department um, to help you understand more about elections information educating you and hopefully you feel that by us being able to share this information with you, you have more understanding and more trust in the elections process. I would like to share with you a couple of the 
um, great websites to go to. Remember, this entire presentation is being recorded. So it will be uploaded sometime next week to YouTube and you can view all of this um, and get all of the, the special links. So you don't need to necessarily write everything down, but elections.maricopa.gov. This is our new website. It is amazing. It has so much information. Um, this is where you can get to your voter dashboard, beballotready.vote. Um, this is um, a website where it's, you know, has an easy toggle, Spanish to English. It's very responsive, so easy to get your information. So please do go to elections.maricopa.gov. Also, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, Just the Facts newsletter, it comes out monthly. It is a newsletter that provides lots of great information in a very easy way to view, whether it's on a cell phone or whether it's on your laptop. Um, and this is where you can also, as a subscriber, submit your questions to Scott and Ray, and then they will select some of those questions and answer them in a short video series each month. So you can do that by simply going to justthefacts.vote. We also have on our website uh, materials. You can download them and you can share them in group meetings. Um, on the right, you see their one-page infographics on security topics that matter most. We are in the process of updating these. And then also with all of our community partners, we share these toolkits prior to each election with a lot of wonderful information as well. I'd like for you to remember that we have more virtual seminars coming up. Um, all the ones in the past you can view on YouTube now, but also in September, we're going to um, have a 45 minute virtual workshop to talk about in-person voting and then October 19th, tabulation. We'll have another 90 minute seminar just like this one in September, but it will be all about the general election and what you can expect for the general election. And then we've got lots of public voter events. You can see all of the events on our voter education webpage on our new election, uh, on our new website. Um, but a couple here, we have wonderful public water days events at some Phoenix parks. Um, they're really a lot of family fun and we will provide a lot of wonderful voter education information and materials. Also, the public is invited to attend Mesa Community College. We have great events coming up in September and October to celebrate Constitution Day and National Voter Education and Registration Day. So save the date there. And last, I do want to mention, get involved. We, as Scott had mentioned, uh, need to hire over 3,300 temporary workers. And it's so easy to get involved. Go to getinvolved.maricopa.vote. Um, pick the, uh, the position that seems of interest to you. You can find out more about it with the drop-down boxes. And then simply submit your interest. Someone in our recruiting department will call you back and start the process of getting you hired. We really can't run successful and efficient elections without you, our Maricopa voters. And that includes our high school students that are at least 16 years of age. They can also participate and get paid for working in elections on election day as a student election clerk. This information is also available on the website. So to recap, we've got um, wonderful information for you. Subscribe to that newsletter at justthefacts.vote. You can apply for our student election clerk at outreach at risc.maricopa.gov. Get involved. Um, we need you at getinvolved.maricopa.vote. And of course, you can stay informed with all elections information, including taking a look at your uh, personalized website at beballotready.vote uh, by going to elections.maricopa.gov for all of your elections needs. And I would like for you to be able to stay in touch. I'm going to send you an email, I'm going to ask that you please take a look at that email to provide your feedback because we'd like to hear from you and let us know how we're doing. So look for that email and please take a moment to fill out that survey card. And then um, I would like to let you know that we are having that second virtual in September. So keep an eye out on the um, invites. They will probably be sent out about three weeks prior to each event. And so from all of us here at the Maricopa County Elections Department and Recorder's Office, we thank you for joining us and we hope that you have a great day. Thank you for joining.